Hello everybody, Simon Dixon here and with so much happening around the world in terms of money being created in order to overcome this health crisis that we're currently in. Um, if you're watching this video in the future, we're currently in lockdown during a health crisis and governments all around the world are looking at their strategy for how to fund a lot of this um, this this health crisis and their way out. So what I wanted to do is make sure that everybody had an understanding to the question, who makes money from making money? And the best way to answer that is from a video that I created in July 2019 called The Six Forms of Money. Uh, just to give context, when this was recorded, um, the original video, Six Forms of Money, this was around the time that Facebook just announced that they're going to be um, engaged in creating their own digital currency through a project called Libra. Um, and that was very much the focus of why I created that video so that people could understand who makes money from all the different forms of money. Um, and so that's the, the context. Um, at the moment, a few things have changed since that video is recording. The economy is moving at an absolute rapid pace and innovation is also moving at the same time. So uh, Facebook have decided to actually pivot into the stablecoin market um, rather than having a basket of currencies. A few other changes, the Chinese Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, has announced DCEP, their digital currency electronic payment system, um, which is their answer to their new digital currency, which is a competitor to the form of digital currency created at the bank that I'll discuss in the video shortly. Um, the, the Financial Stability Board has also announced, um, due to the increase in the size of stable coins, their 10 proposed um, regulations and steps that they'd like to take as an initial proposal. Uh, the market capitalization of stable coin has pretty much doubled to almost $8 billion. And by the time you're watching this video, that might change as well because um, it's moving so fast. Uh, there's also been a war on cash continuing um, as the, the, the latest version of that is it is a vehicle for spreading um, you know, a virus. So therefore, people are scared of cash at the moment, um, which is the first form of money that I talk about and who actually profits when they print money. Um, so those are a few of the updates and um, that's, uh, that's, let's go straight into the content, I guess. Um, and so the, I'll go through the six forms of money. And then at the very end of this video, I'd like to make a really special announcement um, for those of you that have been asking me continually. Um, I'll make that announcement at the very end of this video. Um, so let's just go jump into who makes money uh, when money is created and the six forms of money. So I'll see you on the other side. And also remember, like, share, subscribe. It really helps me get more people see these videos. So head over to my YouTube channel, Simon Dixon, hit subscribe, hit the bell symbol, and then more people will get to see this as more and more money gets created so we can know exactly who profits when all these forms of money gets created. Over to the content. Morning everybody, Simon Dixon here. In this video, I'd like to go over the different types of money and who actually benefits from their creation. The reason I'm doing this is I see so much confusion around how different forms of money are created, who benefits from it, um, and even debates at the highest level. I was watching a couple of debates this morning when people were talking about how governments have this form of currency and Bitcoin came along and created a private version. When in fact, the money supply was privatized a long time ago in most countries around the world. So I just want to get uh, in real simple, plain English for anyone to understand um, an understanding of money. This is what made me obsessed uh, when I studied economics years ago. Even the economic textbooks were giving incorrect assumptions about money. They were saying that banks are an intermediary between borrower and lender, which is a, co a completely incorrect assumption. They were then teaching you things like multiplier effects based upon a base um, amount of currency and then governments use interest rates in order to stimulate how much money is created. Um, I just want to clear up all these things right now and just go through. Um, so firstly, a couple of disclaimers. It will be different in different countries. I'm just giving you the general understanding that you need in order to understand the different forms of money and who benefits from its creation. 
Um, the second thing is there are more forms of money um, and there will be more. I'm just going through the most common one that help you give a better understanding when people are debating and understanding the debate. So let's just jump straight in with the first form of money. And the first form of money is money that is actually created by a government. Well, in fact, it's outsourced by the government but controlled by the government to their central bank. And the central bank has, um, which is cash, it comes in two forms, it's either paper money or coins, and it's created by, in most countries, by a central mint, a royal mint. Um, and that mint is the person that actually creates those coins um, and uh, prints those notes. Now, the way that this is actually done is it's created by um, a, a royal mint or a central bank in order to meet the obligations of private banks, which are the creators of the next form of money, digital money. Um, and uh, when you go to an ATM, uh, a, a, an automated teller machine, and try to withdraw cash, banks want to keep enough cash in order to fulfill uh, those obligations to prevent a bank run. So if you decide to turn your bank deposit into cash, um, then they need to make ensure that they have enough cash in order to meet those obligations. Um, it is by you know it is a tiny fraction of money in the economy. In many economies, it's only about three percent, uh, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on the dependency of that country upon cash. Um, but the way that it's actually created is it costs approximately you know let's take a ten dollar note. It, it costs approximately three cents in order to print that note with the economies of scales uh, with, uh, at the Federal Reserve and the mint they use in order to print them. Um, and if it's a $10 note, there's approximately $9.97 in margin. Now that $9.97 um, is profit that is added to tax revenue and it's called scenerage. Uh, scenerage is the amount of money that the government makes as a result of printing cash and coins or uh, minting cash and coins. Um, and so it's a profitable activity and it reduces the liability for taxpayers, um, reduces uh, the government debt and is transferred from the central bank to treasury and appears on the treasury balance sheet. So the more cash um, in an economy, uh, in theory, that government created money which reduces the amount of tax one should have to pay if the, if the government is actually uh, balancing their books and trying to do that. Obviously, they don't do that, but seniorage income is something that uh, the Treasury, uh, the government, benefit from, and it is actually the only form of money that they actually create, uh, with the exception of some other new uh, forms we'll go through. So, um, cash notes, uh, coins, they are government-created money, um, and uh, tax pay, it reduces the amount of tax one has to pay based upon seniorage income. And therefore, you would imagine that the people benefit from that or the government benefit from that, depending on your philosophy and ideology about whether your government is serving you or not. Uh, the next form of money is bank deposit. So the funny thing is, is everyone talks about the, the, the government printing too much money at the highest level. Um, we're talking about, you know, world-renowned economists talking about this. But the reality is that the vast amount of money in the world is created by the private banking sector, and money is actually privatized. Uh, people talk about uh, Bitcoin being a way of, um, you know, pr a private form of money that competes. It does compete, but we already have private money. It's called bank deposit. So if you log into your online banking right now and you see a positive balance, it's because somebody else has a negative balance. Because for every positive balance, um, somebody else has to go into debt. So the way that it actually works is that when you go to a bank and you borrow some money, um, a banking license gives the bank the ability to create money every time they issue a loan. And the way they do this is through double accounting on the bank's balance sheet. Uh, they put, when they create, an, when they issue a new loan, um, it is both an asset and a liability to the bank, and it is added to their balance sheet on both sides so that they match up. The reason that they consider it an asset is because if they issue you a loan, they get interest from that, and that is pr the profitable activity at a bank. Um, the reason it's a liability is because when they add that deposit to um, your account, 
Uh, that is money that was created out of thin air that they now, you have a right to claim upon and you could draw cash upon it or you could spend it. And so you create a, a bank will create an asset and a liability simultaneously every time they issue a loan. Now, while you don't need to understand the accounting, all you need to know is that when a bank um, issues a loan to you, it's not somebody else's savings. It's not money that they had. Um, it is um, essentially brand new money that they create. And what they do is they type it in the, the computer. It appears as a digital representation of the government's currency in your account, and you can spend it and use it as debt. Now remember, uh, the governments, they create cash and coins, but they outsourced digital currency. So banks were the inventors of digital currency. When they managed to persuade lawmakers um, when, uh, after, the, after um, many early bank runs, that they should be allowed legally in order to create more deposits and actually exist based upon debt. And so um, that, that is the, the process of that. Now, when you, re, when you take out a loan, the money supply in the economy increases because it's brand new money. The beneficiary to that is the bank because they actually get to charge interest on that money. Um, when you repay that loan, the money supply contracts. Now, in most economies, about 97% of the entire money supply is created digitally by a bank, and therefore most money in the world is already privatized. However, crony capitalism means that you have to have a banking license in order to engage in that process. Um, and the governments of the world have outsourced the creation of that digital currency to the private banking sector. If you live in the United States, then they call it, it's essentially a digital version of the US dollar. If you live in, the, 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 in England or wherever, it's a digital version of the Great British Pound. It's a digital representation of the money that the government creates. And so, but it's not actually created by the government. Now, central banks around the world try to influence how much debt bank, uh, how many loans banks create uh, through different tools, through monetary policy, um, through um, incentives to try and encourage people to um, move into home ownership, which is the largest tool for creating digital representations and bank deposits of your government's currency is the mortgage markets, the real estate markets, the property markets, uh, because banks have decided that it's the safest um, yet most profitable form of creating debt. And therefore, if, the, if, you run a, if you can't repay it, they can repossess the property. The property or real estate can't run away. And therefore, you know, almost 40% of all digital money is backed by the mortgage markets um, in, in many, uh, syst in many uh, systems. So the point to understand the takeaway is that if you log into your online banking and you have a positive balance, somebody else has to have a negative balance for that positive balance to exist because governments have outsourced money creation, the digital currency, um, of the, the fiat currency of that government to the private banking sector and therefore all money is backed by debt um, in, uh, in the digital currency system. The, 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 and this is why it's really, really funny that many, many people in government don't realise that um, and uh, it's a big problem. The third form of money, so just to recap, you've got cash and coins created by the government and the government, uh, uh, it's used as a scenerage income to reduce taxpayers' burden. Uh, bank deposits is a digital currency which is a representation of the, of the government's currency that's created by the private banking sector and the private bank benefits from those interest rates, uh, the, the interest that they can charge on that money that they create. Um, but as the money, as you miss you more loans, the, uh, the, the money supply increases. As they are paid down, uh, they disappear and the asset and liability go off the, the bank's balance sheet. The third form of money is quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is a new form of money that was invented in Japan uh, by the Japanese central bank that later um, was used very famously after the last financial crisis which is essentially where the central bank um, engages in money creation uh, by uh, creating money that then can be used in order to issue loans to 
um, both the banking sector, large corporations, uh, through the debt capital markets, through bond markets, uh, products where you essentially were created in order to lend money to governments or lend money to large corporations. Uh, they are created at the central bank. Um, and this is a way of flooding, uh, you know, flooding uh, money into the economy at times of extreme, um, you know, extreme events like the financial crisis or a new tool that governments have used in order to actually try and um, or, or central banks have used in order to try and exercise more control because they outsourced money creation to the private banking sector. Now, quantitative easing is a, is a fairly new tool. Um, and uh, is being used a lot right, right now, and um, uh, the, the central bank's balance sheets have gone completely out of control as a result of quantitative easing in order to prop up the economy a little bit longer. Uh, the next one that's worth uh, talking is what's called a reference currency. A reference currency or a reference uh, product is where it is uh, one form of money that represents another form of money. Um, an example of this is a stable coin or PayPal or something like that. It's essentially a new digital ledger created by a private company or um, anyone really that could create a reference currency with a promise that it is backed by uh, the fiat currency, uh, either the digital version or the cash version. You haven't seen many cash versions. Um, but uh, essentially, an example, uh, a modern example in digital currency uh, lingo is something like a stable coin. Um, and it operates similar to something like PayPal, where PayPal promised for every um, dollar that you have in PayPal, there is a dollar at a bank, uh, at PayPal's bank. Um, the challenge with reference currencies is that uh, over time, uh, the actual reference uh, for whatever reason tends to uh, be moved away for, for something. So a very famous example recently is uh, a very, uh, the most liquid stable coin is Tether. Now, uh, Tether got itself in a situation where uh, one of the, the financial institutions that was holding some of the dollars that it refers to um, actually uh, allegedly had nefarious activities with it and therefore a government seized some of those um, dollars. Um, and therefore, while the, the tether is backed by those dollars, some of those are held and inaccessible by government institutions which have seized those tethers. Um, and so therefore, Bitfinex needed to find, uh, or tether needed to find another way. Uh, they're both the same, uh, different companies, but owned by the same parent. Um, they had to find a way of uh, actually bringing back that reference. But over time, reference currencies have always had challenges keeping the reference, um, and there's always some kind of incentive to engage in the banking model. Um, and uh, so this is essentially a form of, the banking model is what's commonly known as fractional reserve banking, which is where um, you take a little bit of that deposit and you expand it beyond the money in existence. Um, fractional reserve banking is actually very misleading because there's ways of getting around the reserve um, and uh, many uh, of the banks actually get around those reserves, um, and there's ways of getting around the fraction. Um, so fractional reserve doesn't actually exist in many economies because sometimes there is no reserve and there is no fraction because the reserve might be uh, another form of money like bond markets, which were created as debt in the first place. So you've got debt being that reserve of the debt. Um, so therefore, it's not really uh, a, a sufficient reserve because you can reserve it by assets. And the fraction can actually be loopholed by um, using uh, regulatory arbitrage between what a retail bank can do, what an investment bank can do, and what a fund manager can do. And that was what we saw during the last financial crisis. In the last financial crisis, we saw uh, retail banks saying that they were operating off a fractional reserve system, and therefore um, they were being regulated under that. However, they took a lot of their mortgages um, and they sold them on to an investment bank or an investment bank packaged them up, whereby you could take all these individual mortgages, put them into one financial product, um, and then you could uh, then sell them to somebody else as a packaged product. Uh, this is what was known as asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, um, and uh, all these different terms that came out of the financial crisis. 
Um, you then took the investment bank, then took them, and uh, they sliced them up into different pieces so that they could sell them to fund managers and pensions. Um, and uh, then they created other products where derivatives were created, where there was a reference to the underlying mortgage product, which was a slice of somebody else, of a load of mortgages, which was packaged up from the retail bank in terms of a tiny um, individual mortgages. Um, and then you really didn't know who actually was. And then what they did is they created another innovation where they sold insurance, um, but they turned the insurance into a security whereby it could be traded um, and people could buy and sell that insurance. And Lehman Brothers was one of the largest insurance of all these products. And so uh, there was an issue where all the systemic risk of that entire system when people didn't know uh, because the retail bank was just issuing as many mortgages as possible, the investment bank was packaging them up in order to get around fractional reserve requirements. Um, and then they were selling them to your pension and therefore the person that was issuing the loan no longer um, cared if it was repaid um, because it was a, a essentially sold on to your pension. Um, and so you had the liability without actually knowing about it. Um, and then hedge fund managers were coming along and speculating on, the, on these products. Um, and then you had just a speculative frenzy around this. And that's how you, know, you get around fractional reserve banking, by playing what an investment bank can do, what a retail bank can do. Anyway, slight tangent, uh, but I thought it would be useful. So stable coins is a movement towards full reserve banking. It's a reference currency. Um, and it promises that everything is backed by whatever it says it's backed by. Um, so if you have a, a stable coin backed by dollars, then it's backed by dollars. And it's a f that, within that particular system is full reserve, which is a movement towards you know, more of an asset-based economy or asset-based form of money. However, whatever is backing it up uh, might be fractional reserve. Uh, so you could have a bank created the money, the digital representation, and then a stable coin is referenced to that digital representation. So it's a bit of a, of, of a pony game, um, but it's a, it's a movement towards uh, full reserve banking. And the final uh, couple of forms of money that I wanted to discuss was obviously Bitcoin. And I put Bitcoin in its own category because it, it does have its own monetary policy. It is very distinct from all other cryptocurrencies. Um, and most other things that you see, if you go to a website like CoinMarketCap, you'll see two and a half thousand uh, different uh, cryptocurrencies, but some of them are tokens, which are more like stocks and shares, um, and uh, others are just completely different uh, use cases and things. Um, really, when it comes to uh, actual sound money, then Bitcoin BTC is really the only game in town. And the reason for that is because of what we saw the last couple of weeks with Facebook. So when a centralized institution or company creates their, own, their new form of money, um, and if you have real traction like Facebook has where you have 2 billion users, you get every form of government, every form of monetary policy, um, every form of everything turn up and you get a Facebook hearing where you've got to explain every part of everything that you're doing. And eventually, if the government doesn't like what Facebook is doing, then they just can write it into law, shut it down, get rid of it, do what they want to do, co-opt it, get a backdoor. I think that in the end, they're going to co-opt and go for the data of having a world currency that might be able to achieve um, greater, uh, you know, a, a different thing to the dollar. But um, essentially, the reason that Bitcoin is different is because there is no CEO that you can put into a, a, a hearing. Uh, there is no identifiable creator. Um, and it was created at a time when nobody cared in a very decentralized way when it was never priced. So people weren't speculating on it. The foundation of Bitcoin was when it was actually a genuine um, form of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash where nobody was really going to benefit from it. And it was, uh, it was later that it became valuable and had trading and all these other types of things. Um, but at that point, uh, the, the creator of Bitcoin had left the project and it's now an open source technology that is powered by the largest supercomputer in the world. Now, the important thing about Bitcoin is that the, the people that benefit from it, uh, from its creation, are what, known as, are, are what are, are known as miners. Um, and the way that Bitcoin works is there's only ever going to be 21 million of them. Uh, that money supply can never change unless over 50% 
of uh, operators in the network decide that it's going to change, which nobody will do, and therefore it's a, it's a scarce digital peer-to-peer uh, -peer electronic cash system. Um, the the, uh, the way that it actually comes into existence is that it has a set release policy. So every four years, uh, the number of Bitcoins that get created it decreases by a set amount. So it started with uh, every 10 minutes, 50 Bitcoins were created and they were awarded to the miners. Uh, the miners are people that verify all the transactions by running automated um, computers, hardware, and, uh, and algorithms. <clears throat> um, and essentially, they verify every single transaction. Um, and they're, they're given newly created Bitcoins um, every 10 minutes, and they're distributed amongst the miners through the system of pooling. And so um, it costs a lot to run these um, computers, and so it encourages longer-term holding because uh, while you might have to sell some of those Bitcoins in order to cover the cost of your electricity, it's a very efficient market that adjusts to market demands uh, for Bitcoin and how many people want to mine. And the more and more people mining, the more difficult it gets. So it, it mimics some of the properties of gold, um, but has a much more uh, measurable um, fixed uh, supply to it and is more scarce. Um, so the way that it works, as I said, uh, 50 bitcoins were issued, were given to miners every 10 minutes, and that goes on for four years. And every four years, the number of bitcoins um, given to miners every 10 minutes halves. So originally, it was the first four years, it was 50 bitcoins every 10 minutes being distributed to miners. Uh, the second four years, uh, from year four to year eight, it was 25 bitcoins um, uh, issued to miners every single. Uh, 10 minutes, and then it moved to 12 and a half, and then the next halfening coming up in uh, 2020 as well, um, it moves to uh, 6.25 until eventually the number gets smaller and smaller and smaller and all 21 million Bitcoins are created. It's worth noting that approximately uh, 17 million of them have already been created, and estimates state that anywhere between 4 and 6 million of them have just disappeared and been lost, uh, because it is a bare asset, and if you lose access to them, uh, they just disappear. So the more people lose them, the more scarce it gets in a very ruthless, brutal um, system of uh, you owning your own money and taking responsibility of securing your own money because it's not held at a bank and therefore the bank can't create um, new money based upon that. Um, and it's a different form of money and a completely new money supply. It provides an exit from the traditional financial system. So you can see cash and coins Digital currency created through deposits, quantitative easing are all form are done by one currency within in different forms um, based upon the government's currency, uh, which is either the US dollar or the pound or wherever you are or the euro. Um, and so uh, these are the different. So then you have that was Bitcoin anyway. So Bitcoin is a completely independent form of money with a fixed supply. And in my perspective, our world's best shot at ever achieving sound money. Um, and then worth mentioning is obviously in comparison is Facebook. So Facebook's Libra um, is obviously going to be a reference currency. They've stated that it's going to refer to a basket of assets. I think in the case of US, it's going to be US dollar. Um, we don't know the full details yet, um, but it's really producing an interesting contrast to Bitcoin of what happens when you try to do something like what Bitcoin created, but via a centralized company. And therefore, uh, you have to, you know, uh, bow down to the system and be at the mercy of the powers that be. Um, and so really, it's shown in stark contrast of why it's important for Bitcoin to be decentralized and why it's so different from other cryptocurrencies where a, a person has come along or a group of people or a company has come along and uh, tried to create their own version of Bitcoin. And then everybody falls to that leader um, and everybody's looking at that leader in order to push the currency forward. And you end up with a version of what happens with Facebook where... Facebook, essentially what they're doing is they're doing a hybrid model where they're trying to get a hundred of the largest companies in the world, like Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, 
um, to act as what is known as node operators, uh, where they verify all of the different transactions and receive the reward from the newly created Libra currency um, in a syndicate of uh, these, these companies. Um, and uh, the challenge is, is that these 100 companies, um, initially there's probably 20 to, to 30, um, they have an incentive once they own the monetary system uh, to actually either change the reference to vote on that as a syndicate um, and then those 100 you know, node operators can actually decide that they might want to engage in fractional reserve, apply for a banking license, um, and as you know, it's such a profitable activity, um, that can change the money supply significantly in terms of that new form of money. Um, and therefore, uh, you're at the mercy of what these companies decide to do. And Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, you know, are all people that have engaged in creating reference currencies. Um, and then you've got uh, other companies that might want to engage in that. So it, it's, it's very different to Bitcoin. But let's just recap very quickly and close this video. So the first form of money that I covered is cash and coins. Cash and coins are created by the government via their central bank and mint. Um, and uh, when they create it, they sell it to a retail bank. They, it may cost three cents to create a $10 note. There's $9.97 once they've sold it to the retail bank for their ATM. And that is added and transferred to treasury and reduces the amount of tax revenue some uh, a country has to pay. Then you have bank deposits. Bank deposits are issued every time a bank issues a loan. They're 100% backed by debt. It is a digital representation of the government's fiat currency, and it is created by a private banking sector. Uh, the private bank receives interest on that money, and therefore they benefit from the creation of that money. Quantitative easing is money created at a central bank using um, debt-based products. Um, and the beneficiary to that tends to be the recipients of that product that gets an artificially low interest rate um, on a large loan uh, backed by the country's central bank, which is essentially, as long as the system exists, as good as credit rating as it can get. Um, and uh, the, they do that in order to push money into the economy. Um, then you have uh, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, stable coins. Uh, stable coins are reference currencies. Um, they're backed one-to-one -one by the government-created currency or the digital representation of the government's created currencies. And once you have that stable coin, then you can either earn interest on it or you can do things with it or you can create a business model around that. Um, and the issuer is the beneficiary. Um, JP Morgan's looking to create their own stable coin and many other people doing it. Central banks are going to create their stable coins, I believe, to bail out the financial system. See some of my other videos. Um, and then you've got Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is an independent money, money supply, uh, is, is backed by maths and code, it cannot be changed, it's scarce, digital, um, and it's apolitical, and uh, is not affiliated with any companies or countries' agenda, and it's sufficiently decentralized, wherefore I believe it's our world's best shot at achieving sound money that I believe will eventually be purchased by central banks and added to a basket of reserves and potentially could become one of the assets as a world reserve cryptocurrency, uh, world reserve currency as well. Um, and then you've got things like Facebook, which is a hybrid model uh, where a bunch of companies and centralized organizations all organize themselves around um, being the, the validators, like similar to Bitcoin, but rather than decentralized, a group of permissioned companies that are able to do that. And they create a reference currency, and then the node operators can dictate the vision uh, moving forward. So I hope that was useful for you. It's a really, really tricky to topic. Um, one of the big problems in financial technology is finance is completely jargon rich, different jargon for different countries, confusing as hell. Um, technology is completely jargon rich, uh, different standards exist um, in different things. Create finance technology and you've got a jargon hell and nightmare. And my goal is to try and navigate you through uh, in these tweets and give you content so that you can make better informed decisions about where to actually place trust and where to put your money, um, not financial advice. You have to do your own research. I just want to give you more information uh, to be able to uh, decide what you're going to do 
Um, and check out my other videos if you want more content on how the financial crisis is going to play out, whether it's what Facebook cryptocurrency is doing, um, where, how the financial crisis, what are the systemic risk events, which countries are positioned themselves to be the next world leaders, what's going to happen to the US dollar. I'll keep uh, providing commentary as this all unfolds. Uh, remember to retweet this, like this. If you think others can benefit from this, please help me in sharing this content. I'll also repost this on YouTube. If you're watching it on YouTube, subscribe over there. My YouTube channel is called Simon Dixon. Um, if you hit the subscribe button, there's a bell symbol next to it and YouTube will send you an email every time um, I create a video just like this. Um, and really want as many people as possible to be understanding um, money because I think that we're about to engage in one of the largest uh, wealth divides, the you know, uh, wealth reallocations that we've seen in financial history between those on the right side um, and those on the wrong side. And you're going to have to make your decisions and speculate upon that. And if you don't speculate upon that yourself, then someone else is going to be doing the speculation for you. And you're at the mercy of whoever you are holding your money with because they're the ones speculating for you. So I'm going to go back to work um, and thank you for your time. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you now know who profits when uh, money is actually created. Um, I think it's really important to do that so that people can follow the money and um, understand more. So um, if you like that content, then I've got a lot more for you. I've got two things I'd like to do for you um, and I'll share that with you and one special announcement. Um, so firstly, isn't it interesting how the Facebook Libra project actually mimics many of how the Federal Reserve was created. So for those of you that don't know the full history, the Federal Reserve is not a federal institution. It's a private cartel of banks. That is no conspiracy theory. That's just fact. Um, and it was created by a bunch of banks, which you could call node operators, all coming together and looking at how they can add more stability to their banking system and essentially back uh, their risk taking with, um, with a government uh, organization um, that is independent of the government, but is essentially a cartel of private banks. Hence the reason why you should look at those decisions, trace the flow of money, and really understand that in the environment we live today with the health crisis, governments aren't actually creating money, which they have the right to do. Um, and remember, when governments create money, it reduces the amount of tax that we have to pay as a civilization, but instead, the government is borrowing the money by creating bonds. Um, the Fed is just creating the money in order, to, um, in order to purchase those bonds. And so the Fed ends up with all the world's assets. So all the central banks um, are ending up with all the world's assets because they're engaging in money creation in order to purchase assets. When really the government, the, you know, the, the real good question, I got a question just like this. Well, if, if governments can print so much money, then why do we need to pay tax? Which is actually a really good question. Um, and I don't wanna go into the inflation argument uh, because that's covered in other videos. Um, but remember um, in, in other videos, I cover the whole, you know, what types of money creation is inflationary, which is deflationary and what can lead to hyperinflation. I'll cover that in future videos again as this whole situation unfolds. Um, but it's a really good question because the reality is the reason that we pay um, so much tax is because the government have given their right to create money like they do with cash and coins that they still exercise um, to the private banking sector, which is backed by the Fed. And in times of quantitative easing, the Fed is the one that's the beneficiary. Um, and so the reason that we pay tax is because the government has to pay the interest on all of this debt. And as it borrows more and more through the bond market, the, the, the amount of um, tax you need to pay in order to service the government's interest um, increases and increases in the in the what I call the world's largest regulated Ponzi scheme that has to be reformed because it's now reached the edge and its limits. Um, and if you want to know more about what I think comes next in the current environment, then I created a video called "The Real Estate Market Crash and the Ten Steps That Come Next." Um, so that is really a natural continuation. Now you have this understanding on the different forms of money. Um, now, the final announcement that I wanted to make 
is firstly, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to create more content as everything unfolds so that you can understand these massive complexities of our financial system and you can make better decisions about how to allocate your funds and where you move and how to navigate this environment and make better decisions. I can't give financial advice. Um, but one of the things that I've been most frequently requested is to condense this all together um, into some kind of course uh, whereby I go, if I were starting to get again from scratch in the current environment, what moves would I make? And that's a really interesting question. So I'm going to be thinking about that and uh, putting that together. Um, so watch out. So stay subscribed to my YouTube channel so that I can share information on how that uh, unfolds because I really want to have something that people can use and navigate and really um, what I would do if I were starting from scratch um, in the current environment. The other thing is I'm really pissed off with my book publisher. Um, so if you're watching this video, my book publisher, please get in touch with me. Um, I, I created the book, I started writing the book around about the same time that was Bitcoin created. The book was called Bank to the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. So much of what was in that book is relevant today and those who would have read it would have been prepared for the next 10 years ahead. There are a couple of things that if I were writing the book today that I think I got wrong in that book, and that is not focusing on the privacy issue and the infringements upon freedom that come um, as a result of the system that's being created. But I was pretty young, and um, although I got a lot right in terms of the forecasts around financial technology and what would happen to our financial system and banking reforms, and it was a fiction journey where we time travel back in time, um, and fix many of the banking issues. I still stand by many of those and they're becoming more and more relevant today. Um, but if I were to write it again, I would focus a lot more on privacy, blockchain, and obviously go a lot deeper into what Bitcoin has achieved since then because it was a tiny little experiment. Um, I spoke at the first Bitcoin conference in the world while I was, uh, when, when I was uh, launching that book. And, uh, you know, that was what got me into uh, the industry a lot deeper. And I started investing in the industry a bit deeper. But anyway, um, what I'm really pissed off with is uh, I have never actually been paid for any of those book sales. My publisher uh, just simply keeps the money from what I can see. Um, and the annoying thing is, is that I would love to give all of the proceeds from those book sales. I don't want any of them. I'd love to give them to more interesting causes. Uh, the challenge is I can't really get hold of my publisher and they seem to just be keeping the money. So if you're watching this, please reach out um, because I think it's, uh, I wonder what has happened to all those books that have been sold over the last decade. Um, but anyway, uh, that aside, the only thing I can think of doing from here is there's actually a lot of people that could benefit from the book um, without me having to actually figure out how to relinquish control from the publisher. Uh, the contract's actually expired, so therefore, um, why don't I just give it away for free? And that's exactly what I'm going to do, so, um, so that everybody can benefit from that. And uh, I'll be figuring out how to do that in the weeks ahead. So if you want to know how to get hold of the book for free um, so that you can benefit from it uh, rather than uh, my publisher benefiting from it, um, then uh, stay subscribed to this YouTube channel. I'll make further announcements in future videos. So uh, head over to my YouTube channel, Simon Dixon, hit the subscribe button, and then remember to hit the bell symbol. And uh, in a future video, in a future um, video, I'll, I'll figure out how to give this thing away for free um, so that you can get a copy, um, some digital copy, either a, a PDF copy or figure out how to do it on Kindle. I'll get my team to do that. Um, they're currently engaged. My website, simondixon.me, is an absolute mess. Um, what happened there is I used to operate off a website called simondixon.org. Um, and uh, for some reason, I, I let it slip um, over the years, got busy in business and bank to the future, uh, the bot.com, and therefore um, just didn't really uphold it. Um, but I'm going to be recreating that. It's got all of my original articles from 2009, from before Bitcoin was created. Um, and everything that happened ever since. So um, I'll, what I'll do is I'll make sure that we reinvent that, um, make it nice, make it pretty. It's ugly as hell right now. And then figure out a way of how we can uh, give the book away. And also I'm going to start thinking about um, what that type of online course that I could give of if I were starting 
from scratch today with a, a small amount of money, um, what would I do? How would I set everything up? Um, and I'm going to start thinking about that and get my team to do a bit more research for me and see what I can do for that. So if you would like to see something like that, then just let me know in the comments section what types of things you'd like to see so I can design this course really around you. Um, it's become important to me during this lockdown um, because you know so many people are so confused uh, about what to do and, uh, and how to navigate uh, the system that I think we're going to move to. Um, and uh, how to be protected. And that was the original purpose of the book, Banks of the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. And as I said, a lot of it is still true today. It was writ written a long time ago in a different world. Um, and uh, the only thing I really would have changed and focused on is really a focus on privacy, uh, the impacts that it has on freedom when everything, all of these financial technologies uh, get technified, and also the importance of Bitcoin and blockchain as a uh, freedom preserver. So that's what I would have changed. Um, I just, you know, for me, writing a book is like pulling out teeth. It's not a fun thing, um, but I really eff uh, put some effort into it. Today, I'm just much more, uh, I find it much more easier, much more pleasurable to just get in front of a camera, speak to you on video or on YouTube, um, and do some kind of online course. And then uh, maybe I can s describe to you what I would update in that book and give you a free copy of the book is the goal so i uh, hope you enjoyed this content subscribe to my video um, like it retweet it it helps youtube um, decide whether i'm someone that more people should see the content so uh, you know i'd like more and more people to to see this uh, because i'm looking to serve and give everyone what they need in these times as the health crisis unwinds into an economic crisis which then unwinds into a financial crisis and you still have time to get ahead of it and navigate it as this all unfolds peace see you later